Welcome to this first session in our course, Rome from Founding Legends to Mistress of the Mediterranean. And I shall be focusing very much in the earlier part of this course on the legends rather than on such actual history as we are able to recover. I'll give a reason for that in a moment, but the title is Founding Legends to Mistress of the Mediterranean. The cover slide is Jacques-Louis David, The Oath of the Horatii. I will say more about that in a moment, but it's a fine cover image, I hope you agree. Let me begin by explaining, for me, and perhaps for you, why Roman history is so important. If you look at the ancient world, you have a number of very impressive and very creative civilizations. We have the Egyptians, of course, we have the Babylonians, we have the Persians, but our main focus for ancient history is on three civilizations. We look at the Greeks, and we must look at the Greeks because the Greeks are the exceptional people of ancient civilization. Without the Greeks, it hardly makes ancient civilization worth studying. Perhaps I shouldn't go quite that far, but I'll repeat. The Greeks are the exceptional people of the ancient world. You have the Jews, who gave us the Old Testament, and although they might not entirely be happy with the line of descent, they did give us the Christian faith as well. And then we have the Romans, and the Romans are the people who pull everything together. They are the people who combine the Jewish contributions, the Greek contributions, and the contributions of various other people, and who have transmitted those contributions to us along with their own individual contribution. So we'll go through these bullet points. The Roman Empire is the last and greatest of the ancient empires. And let me show you this slide. There is the Roman Empire at its fullest extent. It took a long time to build up to that size, and some of the outer areas were never entirely solid parts of the Roman world. But Rome was the mistress of the Mediterranean and of the hinterland of the Mediterranean for many centuries, from about, shall we say, 200 BC until perhaps 500 AD. So we're looking at 900 years. If you look at the eastern parts, why the eastern parts of the empire lasted considerably longer, but that is another matter. Rome is the empire that connects the whole of the Mediterranean world. And although you can talk about a reset button being pressed with the Islamic invasions, that reset button was not complete. You will, if you look hard enough at the distinctive features of Islamic civilization, see many Roman contributions in their legal, particularly in their legal, and sometimes in their social structures. Where Western Europe is concerned, you can barely talk of a reset button. There were political changes in the 5th century, but the essentials of Roman civilization continued for a very long time and merge insensibly into the new civilization of the Middle Ages, from which we, the peoples of Western and Central Europe, draw our own history. Rome was the saviour and transmitter of Greek civilization, something that I won't discuss at the moment. I've said enough about the Greeks for the moment. I will say more in due course. Rome is also the originator of most of our political and legal philosophy. Yes, the Romans took much from the Greeks and transmitted that to us. They also added their own distinctive contribution. And you see this in particular with their legal philosophy. The English world is somewhat different because we have the common law tradition, which has not been uninfluenced by Roman law. 
But once you look outside the common law countries, you will see that almost every country in the modern world uses a legal system which is imitated from that of the Romans. The Romans are the originators of our alphabet. Yes, they took that alphabet from the Etruscans, who in turn took it from the Greeks, who probably took it from the Phoenicians, but the alphabet we use is the one that the Romans adapted to the use of their own language. And of course, Rome is the cradle of the Christian faith. Christ was born into the Roman Empire, the Christian faith spread in the Roman Empire, and ultimately Christianity became the established faith of the Roman Empire. The bottom right picture on this slide is of St. Peter's Square in Rome, built in a very Roman style, and the Pope still wears clothing which is identifiably similar to the clothing of a later Roman Emperor, and the Pope also derives some of his authority, certainly his secular authority, from various real or alleged grants of the later Roman emperors. And so whereas you can say that Egyptian civilization or ancient Egyptian civilization is interesting but dead, Roman civilization is both interesting and alive. It is something which has held the peoples of Western and Central Europe together for the past 1500 years and the barbarian invasions are not so much a reset button, I will repeat, as a political bump in the line of transmission. Therefore it is very important to know something about the history of the Romans However, the moment you start investigating the early history of Rome, you hit an immediate problem. Here on this slide, you have a list of our main ancient sources for Roman history. You have Livy, writing in the 1st century BC and in the 1st century AD. You have Virgil, 1st century BC. Dionysus of Halicarnassus, 1st century BC. Plutarch, 2nd century AD, Polybius, 2nd century BC, which is quite a bit back, and then you have Ovid, Cicero, Diodorus Siculus, and Cassius Dio. These are all relatively late writers. These are all writers who came along many hundreds of years after the real or alleged events in Roman history, put them together into various kinds of narrative structure and then transmitted them to us. And I will emphasize that these writers wrote many hundreds of years after the real or alleged events. Now that in itself should not be a great impediment to taking them as authoritative sources. You don't dismiss the Oxford History of England. You don't dismiss the 13th century volume on the grounds that it was written 700 years after the events. It doesn't matter how long after the events an historian writes. The question is only how well that historian writes up the period. But we do have a problem with early Roman history. And the problem is said to be this. The problem is not entirely this, but the problem is said to be this. In the year 390 BC, in 390 BC, when Rome was already the most powerful city-state in the Italian peninsula, there was a sudden and unexpected disaster. Various Gallic tribes, various Celtic tribes, I might say, burst into central Italy from the north. The Romans didn't think very much of this in the first instance. They assumed that their northern neighbours could deal with this. Barbarian invasions, even before the big ones of the 3rd, 4th and 5th centuries, were not uncommon in the ancient world. The Romans heard about this, said, oh, that's terrible, 
and left it to the northern cities and kingdoms to sort out. Unfortunately, the northern powers collapsed one after the other, and before they knew it, the Romans had a large Gallic army approaching Rome. Rome's walls were not in good shape at this time, and virtually the whole of the Roman army was fighting somewhere else in the south. The Gauls burst into the city, murdered large numbers of people. They tried to take the capital where the Romans held out. They failed, but the whole of the lower city they appear to have burned, and among the buildings that went up in fire were all of the various public record offices. Which means, or which may mean, that when people later on came to write the history of Rome, they could investigate real Roman history back to 390 BC. Before then, they faced an embarrassing shortage of verifiable fact. It seems that the disaster was not as complete as some of the Roman historians believed. There may have been any number of records surviving into the first century BC, the first century AD, but it hardly matters because the Roman historians either were not aware of those records or weren't interested in those records. Now imagine that instead of having mile upon mile of parchment records in the public records office, we had almost no true history for England before about 1400. And imagine that you want to write a history of England before 1400, you would find yourself looking at things like the Ballad of Robin Hood, or the Ballads of Robin Hood, and the legends of King Arthur, and various later references to the Norman Conquest. You would be able to put together a history of sorts, but it would be a history filled with events of dubious provenance, and the whole of it would not really be open to any kind of verification. And that is the case with early Roman history. When those historians from the 2nd century BC, and particularly from the 1st century BC, came to writing a connected narrative history of Rome from its earliest days, they found that they were unusually reliant on old ballads, on legends passed down for many centuries from mouth to mouth, and on brief mentions by Greek historians, and on various monuments, inscriptions, profoundly imperfect manuscript sources for the early part of Roman history. For this reason, much of the history that I shall be telling you will be false history, it will be fictional history. Some of it is true, nobody doubts that some of it is true, but we don't know which parts are true. But I will defend my choice of looking at the traditional accounts in a moment. What can the archaeology tell us? What can archaeology and general modern research tell us about the history of Rome in its early days. Well, here on the right of the slide you have a map of Italy. Notice the white patches going down the Italian peninsula. Those are the mountains. Italy has this long mountainous spine going down its centre, sometimes very high mountains. If therefore you want to travel from southern Italy to northern Italy, or from northern to southern Italy, you need to go along the coastal plains to the east and the west. If you want to travel along the western coastal plains from south to north, you will eventually hit this red line, which is the River Tiber. Not a wide and impassable river, like the Rhine and the Danube, but still a substantial river. People don't like to get their feet wet. And so the most obvious crossing point for the Tiber is this yellow dot, which just happens to be the site of Rome. 
we can assume based on the geography that at some point in the late bronze age a set of villages came together on the hills overlooking the most likely crossing for the Tiber and these villages then controlled access between northern and southern Italy. The archaeology tells us indeed that you have a set of Bronze Age villages on each of the seven hills of Rome. The archaeology tells us that these villages gradually grew in size until they joined up and seven villages became one much larger settlement. We know from the inscription evidence and from various other kinds of evidence that around the 7th century BC the Romans had adopted the Etruscan alphabet with progressive modifications for their own language. We know a reasonable amount about the early Romans from the archaeology. What we do not know from the archaeology is any kind of narrative history. It is said that we are able to see evidence of social and political changes in Rome around the year 500 BC by looking at the remains of urban buildings. And that may indicate the transition from a monarchy to a republic, but I do suspect that without knowing there was a transition from the monarchy to the republic, we might not be able to recognize those changes. So that is what the archaeology tells us. And I'll repeat that from the archaeology, you are completely unable to reconstruct any kind of narrative account of the foundation and growth of Rome. We really are reliant on the historical traditions which have been transmitted to us by the Greek and Roman writers of the two centuries surrounding the birth of Christ. I propose in this course, in the early parts of the course at least, to follow the traditional and largely mythical history of Rome there is a very good reason for doing that. Well, there are two very good reasons for doing it. One is that it's filled with good stories, good and inspiring stories. The other reason is that even if a nation's history is almost entirely mythical, that history is still worth studying so far as belief in the truth of those myths has an effect on the thoughts and behavior of that nation. And there is no doubt that the contemplation of their own alleged early history had a profound and lasting effect on the thoughts and on the behavior of the Romans. At all times in their long history, Roman children were brought up to believe this alleged history of their nation and to be inspired by it and so far as they were able to imitate the example or the alleged example of their glorious ancestors. It is very difficult to account for the immense growth and durability of the Roman Empire without knowing what the Romans believed about their early historical origins. Indeed, you could extend that to a third point, and here again is the painting by Jacques-Louis David, The Oath of the Horatii. This was exhibited in Paris in 1785. It shows a critical moment in the later Roman monarchy. Those three young men have decided to start a rebellion against an oppressive king. They are swearing an oath, as the swords are being handed over to them, that they will not rest until Rome is free from the rule of an oppressive king. And indeed, they were wholly successful in their endeavor. The monarchy was overthrown and a republic was established. 
a republic which had a long and glorious history for the most part a long and glorious and authentic history of 500 years this was exhibited in paris in 1785 it created a sensation and 1785 that's four years before a most significant event in french history isn't it when the french monarchy went bankrupt in 1788 the men who tried to put things back together were at first acting self-consciously under the example of the english of the 17th century they thought that the revolution of 1789 was the french equivalent of the english glorious revolution of 1688 However, as the revolution proceeded, the English example tended to fade into the background. The example to which the classical French revolutionaries looked, Danton, Robespierre, Marat, and so on, was not England, but Rome. And, of course, Jacques-Louis David, he was the artist who painted the French Revolution. The whole course of the French Revolution from the oath in the tennis court all the way through to the coronation of Napoleon was seen by the French through Roman eyes. They were drenched in Roman history. They believed implicitly in the truth of Roman history. And there is not the slightest doubt that what they believed about the history of Rome had an immense and lasting influence on the history of France after 1789. And so simply looking at the inspiration of Roman history on the French Revolution makes Roman history worth studying, but there are so many other reasons for studying it. Oh, by the way, if anybody has a question, do stop me. I will stop if you make a noise and I will try to answer your question. If I can't answer it, I'll answer it next week, but I probably can answer it. So, having justified my choice of talking about traditional Roman history, let's start with it. It starts at some point in the early 12th century, when the Greeks broke into the city of Troy and burned it. The Greeks besieged Troy for 10 years without success. They eventually got inside the walls by the trick of their wooden horse. And the moment they were in, they set up burning the city and killing everybody inside the walls. Not everybody was killed. Not everybody was enslaved. There were some survivors who got away. And the most notable of those survivors was Aeneas, a Trojan prince, who, instructed by his mother Venus, fled from the city, carrying his elderly father Anchises on his back, holding his little son Ascanius by the arm, and with his wife Creusa following along behind. Creusa was unfortunately grabbed by the Greeks and murdered while Aeneas was struggling forward with his father on his shoulders. And since his father was carrying the statues of the household gods, you can imagine that he was otherwise occupied at the time. Aeneas was instructed by his mother to get away from Troy and to take whatever survivors he could gather into ships and to sail somewhere else in the Mediterranean and to start another city to build a new Troy. Aeneas travelled around the Mediterranean for seven years, stopping here, stopping there, always being nudged onwards by the gods. His most notable stop was in Carthage, where it seemed that he would settle down as the husband of Queen Dido, but Jupiter sent Mercury to give him further instructions, not here, get yourself to Italy. At last, Aeneas turned up in Italy. He encountered various tribes in Italy, the Latins, for example. After a series of unpleasant misunderstandings, the Trojans and the Latins merged into one people. Aeneas married the daughter of King Latinus, Lavinia, 
And as soon as the war was over, Aeneas founded a new city near to the present site of Rome, which he called Lavinia in honour of his wife. After Aeneas died, his little son Ascanius, also called Iulus, became the next king. Because the wife of Aeneas, Lavinia, ruled the city of Lavinia, Ascanius, or Iulus, the ancestor of Julius Caesar, decided to leave the city with a group of volunteers and to found a new city, again not very far away, we're talking about a 30 mile radius of modern Rome, but he built a new city called Alba Longa. You then have a series of kings of Alba Longa, who may have existed, but whose names, as transmitted to us, are almost certainly mythical. But at last, we come to the last kings of Alba Longa, and there was a dispute between two brothers, the sons of the king. You have two brothers, Numitor, who is the eldest, and Amulius, who is the younger. Both of them want to be king. Amulius, the younger brother, has more soldiers, and so he kicks out his brother Numitor, who goes off and does rather ambiguous things elsewhere. Amulius is something of a tyrant. He secures his power by grabbing all of his nephews, the sons of his elder brother Numitor, and putting them to death. He doesn't kill Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia. Even in those days, killing girls was perhaps not entirely the dumb thing. What he did, however, was the next best thing. He made her a Vestal Virgin, which meant that she would have to be unmarried for 30 years, and in that way, there would be no children. However, the god Mars took pity on Rhea Silvia and impregnated her, as Greek and Roman gods tended to do. When Amulius discovered this, he was very angry. He was even angrier when it turned out that it wasn't one child, but twins and twin sons. So Amulius had the twin boys snatched from their mother's breast and the idea was that they'd be thrown into the Tiber to drown. Instead, they were put in a basket, they floated around for a bit, they stuck on a mud bank, and a she-wolf coming down from the mountains to drink noticed them, took pity on them, and fed them with her own milk. There is a statue in the bottom left, we're not entirely sure when it was made, the two boys suckling at the teats, they are 13th century. Some people believe that the wolf itself is 5th century BC. Others believe that it's 13th century AD. The provenance of this statue is somewhat disputed. But it doesn't matter. The legend is, or the, the, the story is, that Romulus and Remus, the two twin sons of Rhea Silvia, were saved by a she-wolf and suckled by them until they were discovered by a shepherd and brought up as his own children. When these boys were old enough, when they were young men, they set out to overthrow their wicked uncle Amulius and to restore their grandfather Numitor as the king of Alba Longa, which they succeeded in doing. After this, Romulus and Remus decided to leave Alba Longa and to start their own city, just as Ascanius had left Lavinia to found Alba Longa. The young men chose the site of modern Rome. They chose that seven-hill patch of land that overlooks the Tiber. There was then a dispute between the two brothers as to who would give a name to the city. Various legends of this, but the most prominent legend is that Romulus killed his brother Remus, and there is an image that I generated with artificial intelligence a little while ago showing the murder by Romulus of his twin brother Remus. 
After that, Romulus gave his name to the new city that he was building, the city of Rome. The legend, or the story that you'll find in Book 1 of Livy's History of Rome, is that Romulus founded Rome. He then gave Rome its most important political and social structures. It was Romulus who called together a senate, a body of 100 elder advisers who would advise the king and who would act as his ministers in various respects. He divided the population of Rome into patricians, that is the aristocratic families, and the plebeians, the commoners. Romulus gave Rome its social and religious customs. He gave Rome its marriage laws. He gave Rome the patron and client system, which I will explain another time. He gave Rome also the worship of certain gods, and he integrated these religious worships into the social and political fabric of the Roman kingdom. Romulus also established the first Roman army, and it seems to have kept something like that shape down to about 100 BC, when the Roman army was professionalised. When Romulus and Remus set out from Alba Longa, they brought a few hundred followers with them. Even in the ancient world, a city of a few hundred people hardly counts as a city. So Romulus sent heralds all through Italy, announcing, I, Romulus, am the king of Rome, a new city. If you want to, come and live in Rome. There'll be no questions asked. And so Rome very quickly filled up with escaped murderers, traitors, political refugees of all kinds, people who had failed in their own cities and wanted to try their luck elsewhere. Rome very quickly became quite a large city filled with some very desperate and unpleasant people. But that was how you filled up a city very quickly in the ancient world. Romulus then faced another problem, which was that not many murderers, not many political refugees, not many failed revolutionaries or general malcontents were women. Uh, so Rome had many men and a shortage of women. This being so, Romulus sent heralds to the neighbouring cities, announcing, I, Romulus, the king of Rome, have established my new city, and I would like to enter into regular diplomatic communications with my neighbours, and part of these diplomatic relations will be the granting of daughters and sisters to my subjects as wives. The neighbouring cities took one look at Rome and said, no, we're not sending our daughters off to be wives of those people. Which was a problem, obviously, a very serious problem. You have a city filled with men and not enough women. Romulus found a very practical solution. Here is a 17th century painting of the event, the rape of the Sabine women. What Romulus did was to announce a series of games in Rome, athletic games. He invited the neighbouring peoples to come and watch the games. So they turned up, many thousands of people, men with their wives and their children and particularly their daughters and they sat watching the young Romans jumping and throwing things and wrestling all the usual games of the ancient world then when everybody was fixed on the games a trumpet sounded and the men left off jumping and wrestling and throwing things instead they ran forward and picked up whatever young woman they had earlier noted and carried these young women back inside the city walls. This is 
as I say, a 17th century painting, and the fashion in the 17th century was for a, a certain fullness of figure, and you can see that the men are struggling to carry these women, but there are many other paintings. So the Romans kidnapped the daughters of their neighbours, the Sabines, took them inside the city walls and shut the gates. There was obviously a war arising from this. For about a year, the Romans and the Sabines marched up and down, sometimes getting involved in skirmishes, mostly burning each other's fields. Then, at last, they came to battle. The Sabines were lined up and the Romans were lined up, ready to draw their swords and start fighting for possession of these women. At this moment, just before the battle was about to start, however, the gates of Rome opened and the women all ran out, bearing the little children that they'd had in the previous year. And they ran between their husbands and their fathers and brothers, begging them not to fight because they would because that would make their little children orphans or would make them bereft of their grandfathers and uncles the sabines looked at their daughters and sisters and at the little children and the romans looked at their own little children they dropped their swords they hurried forward they embraced each other and from that moment, the Romans and the Sabines became a single people. You can believe that if you like. It doesn't have much ring of probability about it, does it? But that is the story that you find in Book One of Livy's History of Rome. It's a story that Ovid wrote up to notable effect in his Fasti. And whether or not you believe it, this is what the Romans believed. And you can see that this was what, until about 200 years ago, most Europeans believed implicitly. Rome was populated at its beginning by various kinds of escaped criminal and by the seizure of women from their neighbours. But whatever the case... Rome was now a city of considerable size, in ancient terms, and it very quickly became the dominant city within about a 30-mile radius. There we go. So here is your mythical timeline of Roman history. Or well, this is the timeline of Roman history. It's the most we have. Around 1200 BC, Aeneas arrives in Italy. 753 BC, the 21st of April, 753 BC, Romulus founds the city of Rome. Romulus is the first king of Rome. After his death, he is followed by Numa Pompilius, and then Tullius Hostilius, and then Ancus Marcius, and then Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, and then Servius Tullius, and then Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the seven kings of Rome, one king of Rome for each of the seven hills. We don't know if any of these kings actually existed, or rather, we do have some archaeological evidence for one of those two Tarquins, uh, Tarquin the Elder and Tarquin the Proud, but it's all rather difficult to reconstruct purely from looking at fragmentary inscriptions. But the traditional history is that during this period of about 250 years, Rome went through seven kings, each of which made a distinctive contribution to the early structures of Roman life and Roman history. However, I've mentioned the two Tarquins. The traditional history, the traditional timeline, says there were two Tarquins, father and son, and that their reigns were separated by the reign of a native Servius Tullius. 
Livy himself admits that Tarquin the Elder was an Etruscan, and here we need to look to some degree at the ethnic or the linguistic map of Italy. This is a linguistic map of Italy from around 400 BC, and it's pretty well the linguistic map of Italy for the previous two or three hundred years. This orangey strip along the western coast of Italy, that is the area where people spoke a kind of Latin. Not classical Latin, but they spoke an ancestor language of Latin, or they spoke the language from which classical Latin later emerged. To the east and north, you have the Umbrians occupying this blue area. They spoke a language which was pretty similar to Latin, not exactly the same, but pretty similar, rather as Italian and Spanish are not at all the same language, but they are pretty similar. To the east and south of the Latin areas, you have the Samnites, or the Samnites, however you want to pronounce it, they also spoke a language which was related to Latin, and the Messapians and Apuleans, they also spoke a language which was similar to Latin, though again not the same. There were various other language groups in Italy, but they're not shown on this map. Most of them related to Latin. Most of them left almost nothing in writing behind them, a few broken inscriptions, a few words scratched on knives or pots, from which we're able to reconstruct that these were Indo-European Italic languages. The green areas to the south are the Greek colonies, which were established after about 700 BC. Indeed, the south of Italy, even to this day, still has small areas where people talk Greek rather than Italian. This may be the last remnant of this wave of Greek settlement from the 7th century BC, or it may be a remnant of the later Byzantine rule of southern Italy. We don't know, but there are still Greeks, or there are still Greek speakers in southern Italy. But in ancient times, much of southern Italy had Greek as the main language. Then you have this red area to the north. These are the Etruscans. They spoke a non-Indo-European language. Their language was in no sense related to Latin. Because it does not appear to have been related to any other ancient language that we know, and it doesn't appear to be related to any modern language, we face difficulties with reading what we have of Etruscan writing because they used an alphabet borrowed from the Greeks from which the Romans derived their alphabet and our alphabet. We can read the words. If you go to the British Museum you'll see an Etruscan sarcophagus covered in writing and it's in words that you can read because it's written in something like our alphabet but we're not quite sure what it means. We don't know the Etruscan language, and for that reason, we don't know a tremendous amount about the Etruscans. They were heavily influenced by the Greeks. They were a wealthy and a sophisticated people, and their tombs are filled with interesting frescoes, and there are pots, and there are paintings, and there are statues, all manner of artefacts left by the Etruscans, but we don't know a tremendous amount about them. Livy, the great historian of Rome, admits that the first Tarquin was an Etruscan who moved to Rome and who was elected king by the Senate and people for his merits. He was a person of considerable ability and the Romans were very pleased to have him as their king. The truth appears to be, and this is a truth insisted on by various Roman historians contemporary with Livy, whose works unfortunately haven't survived, but the truth appears to be that sometime around 600 BC, the Etruscans conquered Rome 
and most of the Latin-speaking peoples and ruled them for about a hundred years. The Etruscans had an immense influence on Roman civilization. The idea of a senate, for example, appears to have been borrowed from the Etruscans. The Roman toga appears to have been borrowed from the, Etr from the Etruscans. The gladiatorial games, which later became a very big part of Roman life, they were copied from the Etruscans. They were copied from the Etruscans and later desacralized and commercialized, but they have an Etruscan origin. Much of Roman religion, which was not borrowed from the Greeks or, or did not come down from the common Indo-European ancestors of the Greeks and Romans, that also appears to have been borrowed from the Etruscans. The custom of trying to tell the future by counting the birds in the sky appears to have come in from the Etruscans. It is probably the case that there was an Etruscan takeover of Rome and that this lasted for about a hundred years and that this is the truth behind the stories in the Roman historians that a family of Etruscans moved to Rome and because of the considerable merits of the members of that family that an Etruscan royal family took over in Rome and held the city for much of the 6th century BC. What happened to the Etruscans? They were conquered and absorbed by the Romans. Etruscan as a language, and certainly as a civilization, was in headlong decline long before 200 BC. Etruscan died out as a living language in Italy in the first century AD. We know that the Emperor Claudius, a man of considerable learning, took the trouble to learn Etruscan and he wrote a long and very well received history of the Etruscans. Unfortunately, the history has perished in its entirety and so we're none the wiser for his efforts but the Etruscans were conquered and then culturally and linguistically absorbed by the Romans, just as every other people in Italy was, with the possible exception of the Greeks. The story of the Tarquins. Tarquin the Elder arrived in Rome in the 6th century BC. He got himself made king. He ruled the city with conspicuous success, building various things, winning various wars, expanding the size and the power of the Roman kingdom. When he died, the kingship reverted to a native, to Servius Tullius. Because Servius didn't want any trouble, he married his daughter to the son of the previous king, to the son of King Tarquin. The son, whose name was also Tarquin, was not prepared to wait for Servius Tullius to grow old and die so that he could succeed, and his wife, the daughter of Servius Tullius, was also somewhat impatient, so they staged a coup against Servius Tullius, they dragged him from his throne in the Roman Forum. They killed him, left his body lying in the Forum. And here is a painting showing Tullia, the wife of the younger Tarquin and the daughter of Servius Tullius, so excited that her father was dead and she was now the queen of Rome that she drove her chariot over her father's dead body. The second Tarquin, unlike the first, was a tyrant. He ruled by fear. He put many senators to death. He put many ordinary people to death. He used the ordinary people as slave labour for his various building projects. But at the same time, although domestically a tyrant, he was a very successful king in his external wars and he continued to expand Roman influence until the Romans pretty well dominated 
all of the Latin speaking areas of Western Italy. Here are two stories about the second King Tarquin, Tarquin the Proud. In one of these stories, Tarquin was visited one day by the Sibyl of Cumae. The Sibyl was a priestess of Apollo. Cumae was a Greek-speaking town in the centre of Italy, not very far away from Naples and, of course, from Pompeii and Herculaneum. It was at Cumae where it was alleged there was an entrance to the underworld. And in Book 6 of the Aeneid, Aeneas persuades the Sibyl to lead him into the underworld. But in this story, the Sibyl visits Tarquin and she offers him nine books. She claims they are books of great value. Tarquin asks, hmm, how much? She states an outrageously high price. Tarquin says something about not wanting to waste the taxpayer's money. At this point, the Sibyl takes hold of three of the nine books and burns them before his eyes. She then offers the remaining six books to Tarquin at the same price. Again, Tarquin refuses, and so the Sibyl takes another three books from the remaining six and burns those in front of the king. After this, she offers the last three books at the same price as the original nine. Tarquin has now decided that the books probably are of value, so he pays the price and is given the three books. This is the origin of the Sibylline books, which were kept in a temple in Rome and on moments of great public danger. They were taken out and consulted. They were filled with prophecies or with general advice on what the Romans should do when they were in particular trouble. The books have a long history. They appear to have been destroyed in accidental fires on several occasions, but were always reconstructed from the memory of the priests who looked after them. Their last mention is just before the establishment of Christianity, after which they seem to have disappeared. But that is the origin of the Sibylline books, only to be consulted in times of great crisis, and they are kept in the care of a special order of Roman priests. Then we have another story about King Tarquin. Oh, and there's another of my artificial intelligence generated images. I couldn't find a decent painting. Tarquin was at war with a city called Gabii, which is about 11 miles southwest of the centre of modern Rome. The people of Gabii refused to give in to him, and Tarquin was unable to win his war. So after his fruitless attempts to conquer Gabi by military violence, he and his son Sextus came up with a clever plan. Everyone knew that Tarquin was a monster. He was a tyrant. It was not a great surprise that he should fall out with his son and that his son should run away from Rome as quickly as he could so that he could stay alive. So Sextus turned up in the city of Gabii saying, my father wants to kill me. You are the only people who can give me refuge. Please let me in. The people of Gabi, being rather trusting, let him in. Indeed, they didn't just let him in. They gave him various jobs in the city, and one of his jobs was as a military leader. Sextus, the son of Tarquin, was notably successful in a number of skirmishes with the Romans, and little by little, Sextus became the most important man in the city of Gabi. Not total power, but he was a man of very great influence, and he was very popular with the young men of the city, whom he had led out on a number of occasions to victory over the Romans in rather small battles. As soon as Sextus had established his position in Gabi, he sent a young messenger, a trusted messenger, 
off to King Tarquin in Rome, asking, well, I now have as much power in this city as you have in Rome. So what do you want me to do now so that I can hand the city over to you? Tarquin looked at the young messenger, didn't trust him, and so he didn't say a word. Instead, he walked out into the garden of his palace, and while the young messenger watched, dumbfounded, continually asking, so what do you want your son to do? But while the messenger watched, Tarquin walked up and down the flower beds, and whenever he saw a poppy, the garden was filled with poppies, whenever he saw a poppy that was taller than the others, he reached out with his walking stick and knocked its head off, all this time not saying a word to the messenger. At last, the messenger, who was tired out from asking and waiting, left, went back to Sextus and said, well, I think your father's gone mad. He wouldn't answer my questions. Instead, he behaved in a very strange manner. Sextus asked, so in what manner did my father behave? And the answer was, he'd walked up and down in his palace garden, knocking off the heads of the tallest poppies. And Sextus obviously realised that this was the message. So Sextus set about bringing trumped-up charges against all the other leading men in Gabii and having them put to death, and sometimes simply sending out assassins to murder them. After that, he was in total control of the city of Gabii, and he simply opened its gates and let his father, King Tarquin, in at the head of a large Roman army. Again, truth in this story, almost certainly none, because you have an almost identical story in Book Two of Herodotus, and either Livy borrowed from this, or it is a story that was imitated by the Romans a few centuries earlier. It's a fine story, though. We now come to the end of the monarchy in 509 BC. And the archaeological evidence leaves us in no doubt that in its early days, Rome was governed by kings. We also know that for the central 500 years of its history, Rome was a republic. How did this transition come about from monarchy to republic? The archaeological and other evidence leaves us completely in the dark. However, the Romans themselves had a story to explain it. Tarquin had alienated the entirety of the Roman aristocracy by his tyrannical behaviour. He had terrified the people in the same way. But Tarquin would have lived out his life as king without any great challenge. But his son Sextus, the one who had tricked the people of Gabi into trusting him, one day went too far. He took a fancy to the wife of a very important nobleman. He took a fancy to Lucretia, a married woman. He managed to stay the night in her house while her husband was away, and in the middle of the night he jumped on her and raped her, or rather he jumped on her and blackmailed her into consenting to sex, saying, if you don't have sex with me, I'll kill you, and I'll kill a young slave and say I caught you both in bed together, and your reputation will be stained for all time. So Lucretia consented. The next morning, she told her menfolk about this, and she then stabbed herself, saying, I know that I am completely innocent of any consent to this outrageous act, but I don't want anyone to be in any doubt. So there you are. I'm going to commit suicide in front of you, and you will know that I'm not guilty of adultery. I'm a victim of rape, or I'm a victim of some kind of fraudulent, coerced sexual assault. After this, the men folk were angry, and here once again is the painting by Jacques-Louis David, the one which caused that sensation, 
and which does by itself rank among the causes of the French Revolution. You've got the husband and the father of Lucretia. You also have Lucius Junius Brutus swearing an oath that they will never rest until they have saved Rome from the tyranny of the house of Tarquin. They go about Rome, they get the support of the aristocracy, they get at least the passive support of the people of Rome, and they shut the city gates. Inside Rome, they do not choose a new king. Instead, they abolish the monarchy and create a republic. It is a peculiar republic, and I'll tell you next week about the Roman constitution. But the most important point about the New Republic is that its senior officials, its most senior magistrates, the consuls, they replace the king. They are joint presidents. If you elect one president, there is a chance, like Louis Napoleon in France in the 19th century, that he will make himself the king, or he'll make himself the emperor. And so you have two consuls who will keep an eye on each other and they will check each other's tendency towards despotic power. They are also elected for only one year at a time. So there are two consuls who are the supreme magistrates in the Roman Republic, two of them to check each other, elected every year so they don't grow used to power. The first consuls were chosen in 509 BC, or so the story goes, on the expulsion of Tarquin and his family from Rome. One of the first consuls was Lucius Junius Brutus, the other was Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, members of the House of Tarquin, I might say. Brutus was himself a nephew of Tarquin, Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus was a cousin of King Tarquin, so the entire house of Tarquin was not expelled, but certainly Tarquin and his son Brutus were chased out of Rome. Rome therefore became a republic in 509 BC, but that is not the end of the matter. Tarquin does not simply go back to his ancestral Etruscan city, and spend the rest of his life moaning about how badly he's been treated by his own people. Tarquin goes round all the other neighbouring cities and the Etruscan cities in the north, which have kings, and he tells them, if this revolution is allowed to be a success, your own power in your cities will be endangered it is not simply for my benefit that I call on your help. It is for your benefit that you should help me. Raise a large army. Let us march on Rome. Let us force the gates open and put me back on my throne and bring an end to this stupid republic. So the Romans have staged their revolution. They have thrown off the tyranny of their last king. They have established a republic with a constitution, but the republic is by no means secure. There is a large and powerful enemy gathering outside the walls of Rome, and there is also internal opposition. There are still many people among the ordinary people and many people among the aristocracy who are not happy with the movement to a republic, and who would like to see a restoration of the monarchy. You can see that when, in 1791, the French abolished the monarchy and eventually put the king on trial and executed him, that they saw themselves as acting within this tradition. And there were certainly many people inside France who were not happy with the abolition of the monarchy and who wanted it back. But that takes us into other areas. So that's not all that I can say about the first few hundred years of Roman history. 
There is much, much more that could be said, but that's as much as I feel that I have time to say in the time available. However, here is a reading list, and I will send these slides to you as a PDF file shortly. There is a reading list which gives you a balanced sample of ancient and modern writings on Roman history. So you have Mary Beard's book, SPQR, a very long and apparently comprehensive history of the city. Michael Grant, a much better historian. You have Livy, the early history of Rome. Oh, Aubrey de Selincourt. He did a very good translation of Herodotus. I haven't seen his translation of Livy, but I imagine it's just as well done, just as idiomatic and just as entertaining. Plutarch, Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. The version I've given is translated by John Dryden, but there are many other translations of Plutarch. A series of biographies which includes Romulus. So you have Plutarch and you have Livy. You also have a number of modern historians. Oh, there's Theodor Mommsen, a German historian of the 19th century. The History of Rome, a very long and earnest and, in my view, almost unreadable history of Rome. But if you have the patience, you will find a lot about Roman history in this multi-volume work. I seem to have given three books by Tim Wiseman. They're very well written and they are recommended. But really, if you want an overview of Roman history, I would go to Michael Grant. And if you want to consult the original sources, Look at Livy and find a rather more modern translation of Plutarch, though John Dryden's translation is eminently readable, even if it is 300 and something years old. So that's all I have time to say for this morning. What we shall discuss next week is more mythical than usual. We're going to look at the story of Horatius at the bridge. We're going to look at the story of Gaius Musius Scaevola. And we're going to look at how Brutus, the first consul of Rome, had to put his own sons to death for treason. All things which had a great influence on Roman thought and behaviour. And, well, if they happen to contain a certain amount of truth, so much the better. <laughs> But I'll let you go. Thank you for coming out, and I do look forward to seeing you next week.